It is my pleasure, honor, and fangirl thrill to introduce tonight's speakers, who will each give a PowerPoint presentation of their work and then answer questions. You are all here because you know both cartoonists. You know Jules Pfeiffer's cartoons, his children's books, plays, and screenplays. Not resting on his artistic laurels, however, Jules has kept up with the times by pioneering new art forms. And here I am not referring to his foray into graphic novels like his just published Cousin Joseph, which you will hear about tonight. No, Jules is much more innovative than that. Pfeiffer, as far as I know, is the only person who has ever drawn his own wedding announcement for the New York Times. You can congratulate him on his recent marriage to Jay-Z Holden. If I listen, you're welcome. <laughs> If I listed all his awards, he wouldn't have time to talk this evening. But I will quote Philadelphia's king of cartooning, Tony Auth, who introduced his old friend Jules when he was here in this room in 1985. Tony noted that while Jules had won what Tony said, quote, the allegedly prestigious Pulitzer Prize, in Tony's view, it was Jules who lent prestige to the prize. Jules is not only known for his memorable characters, but also his memorable quips like, maturity is only a short break in adolescence. <laughs> but the one that's perhaps most applicable for this evening is, I've never met a cartoonist who isn't quirky quirky or weird in some way. <laughs> and speaking of quirky cartoonists, our second guest is the brilliant caricaturist and writer Ed Sorrell, whose work long before the internet appeared everywhere, famously on the cover of Esquire Choir magazine, where many hands were lighting Frank Sinatra's cigarette. And on 41 New York New Yorker covers, as well as the covers of The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times Ma Magazine, and the much more influential Nation Magazine. In addition to his books, children's books and murals, the National Portrait Gallery devoted several rooms to an exhibit of his caricatures in 1998. I have to say, personally, Sorrell was one of my early idols. And you might think that's odd, uh, given my primitive style bears absolutely no resemblance to his sophisticated and elegant line. Something that he was happy to point out to me early in my career. In addition to being an opinionated cartoonist, he was an opinionated critique a critic of cartoonists. And this was a good thing for me because when I went to art school, it was during the era where everyone's an artist and consequently you couldn't get a decent critique. Or it was hard to get one until I wandered into Sorrell's studio on Lexington Avenue where he took one look at my feeble drawings nearly burst into tears and said, and I quote, so this is what cartooning has come to in the latter part of the 20th century. <laughs> he then paused to consider whether to cut his losses and kick me out. But fortunately for me, he said, here, let me show you how it's done. And as another cartoonist here tonight recounted, he took out a pa piece of um, uh, uh, yes, pa you know, paper. Yes, put it over my cartoon and said, 
this is how you draw a lamp. And he took my spindly little lamp, brought it into the foreground, and all of a sudden, there was a drawing. So believe me when I say it is really, for me, a terrific honor to introduce tonight's guests. Please welcome the weird and quirky Jules Pfeiffer and Ed Sorrell. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I know from what you've heard, you probably think I know what I'm doing now, but I still don't know what I'm doing, and I'm always surprised by how it turns out. Uh, let me tell you about the book about Mary Astor. Fifty years ago, I married for the second time, and we had no money, and we needed an apartment, and we found one in, in those days. There was no internet. You bought the New York Times on Saturday night, where they had the Sunday classified, and there was an apartment for sale for $97.14, five rooms. <laughs> and uh, there was a catch to it. It was a professional apartment. A professional apartment meant that the landlord could charge more money for it. So what we had here was, uh, was an apartment that really should rent for probably $80, but because I was a professional, I was a freelance artist, I, I, they could charge me more. So the, uh, the linoleum had to be replaced. It was a rotting linoleum. Nancy said, you've got to take it up. So uh, one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers. I finally got to the wooden floor, and there were copies of the Daily News and Daily Mirror from 1936, July 1936. And in headlines as big as World War declared, there was headlines about Mary Astor's diary. What had happened was Mary Astor had kept a diary which her husband found. In this diary, she told about her extramarital affairs, and, she wa and uh, her husband kept it and threatened to ruin her career unless unless she did exactly as he told her. She, he, she wanted a divorce at any cost, and what he wanted was custody of the child, all her money, and, uh, the, and the house that they lived in. And she gave it all to him because not only was her indiscretions in this diary, but she, was, she knew about the secrets of other, other people in Hollywood. So it would not only ruin her career, but the career of her friends. Uh, she got the divorce, uncontested divorce, and, um, and then she began to worry that her husband was going to take the child away and she wouldn't have any, any uh, couldn't do anything about it. So she went to a lawyer and the lawyer assured her that he, he, he could get the child, he could get her custody of the child without the diary being brought into the case, and nobody would have to know what was in the diary. She said, that's wonderful, she was happy, except that she said, I just signed a contract with Sam Goldwyn to star in Dodsworth. It, it, Dodsworth was going to be directed by William Wyler. This was going to be the best role she has ever had in her life. She was essentially a supporting actress playing in grade B melodramas. The lawyer assured her that the, <clears throat> that the trial would not come up for at least a year. She could go ahead, do the movie, and it would turn her career around. So she was halfway through the movie when the trial was called, and Sam Goldwyn tried to get the trial postponed. He couldn't. The lawyer, uh, the, the judge in the case, decided to compromise, <coughs> he, could, he would not postpone the trial, but he agreed to hold the trial at night so that Mary could act in the movie during the day and, 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 and come to court at night. Uh, and uh, this was very difficult for her. And, uh, and now I'll, t I'll tell you the story in pictures. 
this is, uh, this, this is uh, Mary Astor. I have a thing here. Yes, here it is. Okay. Uh, one goes up and one goes down. I remember this. <laughs> And I have to point it. There you go. No, no that's okay. not the one. Oh, okay, I got it. That's it. Let me uh, click on the mic again. Here. Okay. Let me give you. Oh, you're gonna I'm walk sorry. Around. What did I do? Sorry. Right. You're gonna walk around. Okay. I can do the trick. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be careful. <laughs> okay, that's me. I picked up the linoleum and I'm reading the the newspapers, forgetting entirely about putting up a new linoleum. Mary Astor had the worst father. I thought I had the worst father in the world, but her father was even worse because she not only had a bad father, she, had, she did not have a loving mother, which I did have. Uh, this, when she was about 13 or 14, and her father was a, a German who had come to, to America specifically to get rich, and suddenly, after all his plans came to nothing, he decided that this beautiful 13-year-old might be his ticket to money because he was going to make her an actress. He was going to take her to New York and make her a silent screen actress. And when she, re when she one night she didn't do her piano lessons and her poetry lessons and whatever, she, they self-taught her because they didn't want her to go to public schools. They didn't want her to have friends outside. Uh, and this is her, this is the father shouting at her that she had no ambition and, and after all they had done for her, all she wants to do is go to secretarial school and, and be a wife. And, and uh, she, she was a browbeaten child who never was allowed to make decisions for herself. This is, when, when they came to New York, and he kept going to second-rate studios to try to get her a contract, uh, he, there was a photographer who asked to take her picture. And he took this, one of, this is one of the pictures he took of her, and on the basis of this picture, she got a contract with famous players. Uh, <coughs> that, that photograph that you just saw appeared in a movie magazine. John Barrymore, who was on his, who had just played Hamlet on Broadway, and he was declared the greatest, the greatest Hamlet ever to appear in America. <clears throat> he was on his way to California to act in Bo Brummel at Warner Brothers. And he saw this photograph, this, this virginal lady, and underneath the caption, underneath this photograph was, on the verge of womanhood. <laughs> and that's all Barrymore had to find out. <laughs> he insisted that she be his leading lady, and Warner acquiesced. At the age of 17, she became his leading lady in Beau Brummel. They met on the set. She fell in love instantly, and in time, he had his way with her. <laughs> then he had to go on tour in Shakespeare, uh, while her mother, her mother and father, um, she couldn't write to Barrymore, and Barrymore couldn't write to her because all her mail was intercepted and read. But they were already, they were already lovers. And uh, actually, well, it's not quite right. They became lovers when he came back. But he was... He was having sex with a 17-year-old. He could have gone to jail for four years for statutory rape. This is Barrymore on his way going back to America. And this is, uh, this is Mary after uh, Barrymore broke up with her uh, afterwards. He suddenly realized that she, she couldn't break free of her father. She was still, she was still a teenager. And he was 41 years old when she was 17. And so he broke off the engagement, and she, she suddenly became something of a flapper. There she is, uh, 
Mary on the lower, lower right, on location outside San Antonio, fraternizes with the cast of Wings after hours in 1927. She, she wanted desperately to get out of the house, and she met a director at 20th Century Fox, uh, a man who she wrote in her diary is not sensual. In point of fact, he had no interest in women whatsoever, and she was too, too naive a, a woman to realize that he, he was probably uh, just not interested in women. Uh, and this is their <laughs> wedding. The, the, he, gets, he gets killed uh, filming a World War I epic on uh, 20th Century Fox, and so she is a widow at 22. She, she goes, she tries acting, but she's, uh, she's in a very fragile, she, she, if you look at the photographs of her at this time, she's uh, painfully skinny, she's just lost weight, she's, she had, uh, I guess, a nervous breakdown, and uh, her parents, uh, uh, were, uh, th this is, her parents took all her money, and when she remarried for the second time, uh, her husband insisted that he, she have it out with her parents, because she, she was making lots and lots of money, and, and she wasn't keeping any of it, because she was supporting his house, chauffeurs, maids, cars, whatever. Uh, so she stopped payment to him, uh, to her parents, and then while she was on the set making a movie with Edward G. Robinson, she gets a phone call from one of the newspapers uh, and finds out that her parents are suing her for non-support. <laughs> uh, in the book, I pretend to, uh, I pretend to go to the Archdiocese of New York and speak to a nameless Monsignor and explain to him that I have to talk to Mary. I'm sure that Mary is in some Catholic, Mary, who was not Catholic, but decided that Catholicism held the answer to her alcoholism and to her unhappiness and to her loneliness, and she was desperate to get into, and she did succeed in, in joining the Catholic Church in spite of four marriages, but, uh, <coughs> Uh, but uh, so in in this make believe one the the book is 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 true and all the facts are true. But in this one chapter, I do pretend that I am able to interview her. That the Monsignor agrees to bring her down from Catholic heaven and uh, let me interview her. And this is this is Mary flying in, and uh, and I was delighted because. She was 82 when she died, and I was 84 when I wrote this book, so I figured, when I started writing, I figured, well, I'm two years older than her now. <laughs> we can work things out. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Mary and George S. Kaufman in New York. She, the marriage was very unhappy. She got, uh, she got her friend to write a letter of introduction to George S. Kaufman, who was the most successful playwright in New York. They fell madly in love. Uh, it was the best sex she ever had, even better than Barrymore. And, uh, and Kaufman had an open marriage at that time. So everything was fine for a while. And there's, there's Mary going back to Los Angeles after having the best time of her life. And, um, and, and since George S. Kaufman had a an open marriage, uh, Mary couldn't help but hope that she would be his wife number two. In point of fact, in spite of the fact that uh, Kaufman's wife uh, had affairs, and he did, he was, he was, ma he was in love with his wife and, and needed her, and they were in love with each other and needed each other, and George was never going to leave his wife. But she did, uh, as I indicate in this drawing, she, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be together every night? <laughs> and uh, this is just the, uh, uh, this is the drawing for the title page. It's 
it, it's a scene that never happened because it's just a fight over the diary. This is um, when she tried to get a divorce the, uh, and the trial, the custody trial started, her husband started to leak information from the diary to the press. And according to the husband, she not only told of her affairs, but she kept a scorecard as to how good they were. Uh, and here she is denying that she ever kept a scorecard. And of course, Kaufman, once Kaufman's name came into trial, he was hounded everywhere. And uh, here he is pretending that I'm just a friend of Miss Astor like many others. And the reporter is thinking, many, many others. And George, George tries to escape the summons that the judge sends out for him by getting on Irving Thalberg's yacht, but which is beyond the three-mile limits where they can't serve a subpoena, but they do serve a subpoena anyway. And so he's got to escape to, he, he go, he's got to escape from Los Angeles where he has to appear in court. He's a private man, he doesn't want to appear in court. He's got to escape to New York, but the reporters are at all the railroad stations. They, how is he going to get to New York? He goes to his friend, Moss Hart, his collaborationist, uh, his collaborator, and, uh, and he says, nobody's going to remember my plays, my essays, my movies. All they'll remember is that I screwed Mary Astor. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and Moss, finds a way to, for him to escape. They call a laundry truck and put George into a big laundry bin, put the dirty wash over him, put him in the truck, and drive the truck not to Los Angeles where the, where the, where the reporters are waiting, but to Santa Barbara. And there's poor Sam Goldwyn uh, uh, who, who wanted, who didn't want Mary Astor to play the role. He wanted, he had Merle Obron on, on contract, but the director, William Wyler, said, said, you have to get Mary Astor, and says, Mr. Big Shot director tells me not, o only Mary Astor can play this role. Next time I bond his opinion, I'll give it to him. <laughs> and, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the producers in Hollywood uh, try to pressure Sam Goldwyn into using the morality clause in every actor's contract to fire her be, uh, because she was going to bring disgrace on all of Hollywood. And this is Mary Astor refusing to drop the case, which is what they wanted her to do. This is uh, her, her ex-husband showing up at trial. This is Mary Astor entering the court for the first time. And this is uh, her, the ex-husband getting cross-examined by her lawyer. And, and, the, and the, there was no jury. The judge was uh, the judge in the case. It, it was decided by him. And, and the judge finds out that he was having an affair and, and he was having women while, he, while his daughter was with him in the house. So he was not uh, a savory character either. There was a lot, a lot in the book about the trial. Uh, at some point, the trial, uh, she was looking so haggard after wa working during the day and showing up at court at night that the judge finally postponed the trial for one week. Uh, and uh, as, so that she could finish the movie. And she had a final, I don't know if you've ever seen Dodds, but Dodsworth is one of the finest movies that Hollywood ever came up with. It's, it's a magnificent movie if you, if you can get it on your telly, uh, uh, screen it or whatever, whatever they call it. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Stream, stream it. Yes, yeah, stream it. If you can stream it, stream It's a great, great movie. Uh, so uh, William Wyler, I'm going on too long, I can tell. Uh, but uh, 
William Wyler was a director who was notorious for asking actors to do take after take after take. Uh, and uh, and then what made it even worse, he didn't tell them what they were doing wrong. He just said, it would say, do it over. And, uh, and when it came time for Mary's final scene, which is she's on the balcony and she sees Dodsworth returning to her after he thought, she thought he was leaving. And the happiness on her was the way the movie ends. And she took one, one take, and William Wyler uh, said, print it. And this is, a, this is Mary kissing him for taking the first take that she did. <laughs> This is, this is our somewhat out of order. At the end, she wins the case, and, uh, <clears throat> and it's big news. It did make the New York Times teletype uh, building. It was uh, the Mary Astor custody case was big news in London and Paris. It was really big because Kaufman had an international reputation. And, and after, after the trial, her career changed, after Dodsworth, she became beloved by the by Americans. And after winning an Academy Award for a supporting role in The, uh, the Great Lie uh, with Betty Davis, uh, she was in the, the film that made her a star for two years. This is the Maltese Falcon with the usual characters that I'm sure you all remember. This is her winning uh, an, a, a, an Academy Award for supporting role. Uh, notice that the award that the two supporting actors, Donald Crisp and, and Mary Astor, it's not a statuette. Until after the war, supporting actors got a plaque. They did not get the Oscar that you're familiar with. And, and this was the first, America was at war in 19... 42 when the Academy was taking place. And these, these awards were made out of plaster, not, not bronze. Uh, after, there's a chapter about what happened to everybody after the war, after, afterwards. Uh, George S. Kaufman remarried after his wife died and could write nothing but flops. But finally, uh, at the very at the, very close to the end of his life, he writes the solid gold Cadillac, and it's a hit. And there is, there is the end papers of my book. It's Mary Astor. There's her husband going down in flames, <laughs> and all the studios that she worked for, and the diary, and the empty bottle of bourbon. <laughs> and, I, and, there's, and there's me with death. Uh, explaining to death that I only have two more drawings to go. And <laughs> let me. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think. Yeah, okay. This was the first cartoon I did in the Village Voice, and that was my attempt at a style. It's uh, one of the things from the beginning of my career in October of 1956. I always knew how to write this stuff. There was never a question of that. I didn't have a clue as to what the appropriate style for the form of satire that I was inventing at the very moment I did each panel. What, what, what you know, that I had been groomed uh, as Will Eisen's assistant to do comic book stuff, and none of that fit. I. Walt Kelly, who did Pogo, was a hero to me, as at the time Al Cap, who did Labna. None of that style fit. I knew I had to fumble onto something. I was an admirer of uh, Saul Steinberg and William Steig in the work of theirs that, at that time, wasn't in a New Yorker because it was too avant-garde for them, but they, they did books. And I just, and also I used, loved UPA animated cartoons, and I kind of, Every week, my style would change. Sometimes it was UPA, sometimes it was Steinberg, sometimes it was Steig. And it took me a month or so before my drawing evolved. And from there, God help me. Uh, 
Uh, and that concludes my remarks. Uh, let's see. Oh, and, and then, of course, I did The Dancer Who Became Famous. And uh, this was, uh, I got my first apartment on East Fifth Street in New York for something like $20 a month. And the first girl I got up there and slept with was a modern dancer. These things make an impression. <laughs> and, and the dancer was based on, on her. But each time I changed girlfriends, the body of the dancer shifted to the new girlfriend <laughs> until uh, the, the dancer became a somewhat autobiographical figure, and, and I became a cross-dresser. <laughs> and I couldn't give her glasses and a beard, so, I, so there was a generic dancer. But I loved doing the dances because it created movement, and, and basically the style I had evolved in, because it was heavy with dialogue and heavy with message and heavy with trying to tell the story, was... Um, basically talking heads and not a hell of a lot going on in terms of body language. And I loved movement. I loved action. I loved figures doing stuff. And the dancer gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, and then I started doing watercolor drawings. And first I started doing uh, several cartoons based on Fred Astaire. And that led to me doing these watercolor drawings of just movement because everything I did professionally was based on text. And I loved just pouring myself a glass of wine at night, going to the studio, putting on some jazz, and doing dance. I didn't think of doing dancers. I was, I was dancing on paper. And that's what a stair meant to me, the, the sense of freedom, the spirit of uh, 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 what, what, he, what he was during the uh, Depression. Was what we were, uh, and, I'm a, and Ed and I were both depression babies. Was we were living in terrible times, and everybody was uh, was was doing very very badly. But there were these movies, and these movies were celebrated life, and especially Fred and Ginger movies. And I'll get some some others in a minute. But what th these were the epitome of optimism. Uh, even some of the songs, which uh, Irving Berlin wrote, "Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and start all over again." which became a theme of the Depression. And, and for those, some of us, a theme of our personal life, because we always got knocked down. We always got rejected. We always got defeated. And rather than this being a lesson, it was a goad. You know, I'll, I'll make you listen. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. And there was a kind of optimism connected to the Depression that one didn't find in 2008 with the Great Recession. <laughs> But it had to do with our forms of entertainment that were going coast to coast for the first time. So radio was coast to coast for the first time with Jack Benny and Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. And fun, everybody laughing at the same stuff. And movies uh, were coast to coast. And we, so we, we, we had a common culture which we don't share anymore. And, and, peop and that's what helped with the Depression. In addition, uh, now I moved on to doing kids' books. And in the kids' books, the style of drawing had to change to accommodate what the text was. I was always a creature of text. And when I did Norton Justice, The Phantom Tollbooth, I had to learn how to draw as an English illustrator. And when I did Bark George, one of my most successful kids' book, it was kind of a super pop uh, 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 artist uh, kind of uh, 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 drawing. And each book demanded a different style. Because, you know, and, and, and I learned how to change the way I looked, and I learned how to draw in different ways, simply by having to illustrate my own books and figure out how, how they were, what, what they were supposed to do. But, uh, and, um, <laughs> and then I started teaching at Southampton, <laughs> and teaching a, a humor class in writing. And being out there for a while, I eventually moved out there, moved out there for keep and changed my life, and that began the current form of life I'm living in now and permanently. And I went back to what I, my first love, comic books. Uh, there's Popeye in a parody of a famous Superman <coughs> action co uh, uh, comics cover that some of you may remember, picking up a car and banging it into a, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and the, the immediacy of comic books 
the fact that the comic book artists weren't nearly as proficient at their craft as the newspaper strip artists who drew better and thought better and worked better. The crudeness of the comic book was attracted me because, God damn it, nobody was more crude than I. And, 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 <laughs> and it was a form I, I could work well within and I had heroes who, you know, within that. Uh, my biggest hero was a man named Will Eisner who created The Spirit, a, a, a kind of noir comic strip, expressionist, German, Eisner was clearly influenced by German expressionist movies and Fritz Lang and dark angles, and he told stories and he created characters that were memorable in ways that other comic book characters weren't, and he dramatized, he created atmosphere. When there was a street, when it was raining, it was really raining in a nice in the cartoon. When he slugged somebody, that guy really got slugged, you felt it. You felt the emotion behind the work in a way no other cartoonist did. And another one, this great storyteller, Milton Kniff, who did Terry and the Pirates and the later Steve Canyon. He too told these stories, and they were movies on paper, movies on paper, and I thought, what a wonderful, enviable form. That's what I wanted to do, and that's all I wanted to do at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten, until I tried starting to do it, and I couldn't imitate anybody in that style. I couldn't draw in that style. I was not proficient in that style. And so I moved, I mean, basically, to carry out my ambition to be a cartoonist, I was forced to do the social satire that made me famous. But it was a backup position. It's, uh, I wanted to be one of these guys. <laughs> and, 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 and the success of the voice cartoon was, uh, for me, uh, greatly welcome and a great breakthrough, but also it, it proved what a failure I was at doing the things I really wanted to do. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, along with that time, back when I was a kid and loving uh, those great comic strips, Terry and the Pirates and the Spirit, noir began in the form of Bogey and Mary Astor. You know, Ed and I loved the same movies, loved the same stars, were influenced by the same thing. A whole generation was. And, um, and uh, so, uh, Double Indemnity, one of the, the, the greatest of all of the noir movies, well, you know, th th this at the end of World War II, when we were triumphant, uh, and, I mean, or toward the end of World War II, when, when we clearly were untouched uh, at home by the war, uh, and one would have thought that we were just celebrating, but as the war was coming to an end, darkness took over a lot of the films, and threats, and, and science fiction showing the spread of uh, creatures from outer space, meaning reds, and, um, and in noir, uh, Betrayal, everyone betraying you. And I mean, this dark thing, which was tried to, hard for me to understand, but very, very effective and very effective with audiences. And it, it influenced me when I moved out to the Hamptons in New York, out in Long Island, and could no longer happily engage in playwriting because my hearing had pretty much gone south. And it's hard to write a play and not be able to hear your own rehearsals and give notes and all of that. And besides which, I was out of the city, I was old, I had trouble breathing, I mean, all that stuff. With the, you know, I was in my 80s. And I had to find another form that would keep me, well, to make a living for me, but also keep me happy, because happiness in my work has always been a constant. And, and uh, which Ed and I share, of course, completely. And I uh, stumbled on this form of story, to go back to the comic book I love, and to write in this form, write a story that takes place in the 1930s, which was a period I knew well. I couldn't do anything that took place in 2000. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and, 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 but, you know, and, and I didn't know what the music was, but I, but I knew, certainly knew I found a million dollar baby in a five and 10 cent store. And, you know, and, and the best things in life are free, all is depression, so I knew all that stuff. And I was still not far removed from that stuff. So I started fooling around with this detective story, Mo mainly for no particular reason, centered on women rather than private eyes. And, um, and it became Kill My Mother, and I found myself in the writing of it, having more fun than I ever had in my life doing just about anything. And when I gave it to the publisher saying, of course, somebody else has to draw it because I can't draw in this style, they said, no, you're gonna draw it. So I went, out, went home and did a couple of samples, and by that time, brush pens had developed. 
that gave me a facility I never had before with a regular brush that artists, that, that all, the, all the good cartoonists and real cartoonists used. And suddenly I could wield a pen as if it were a pencil and get the kind of effect uh, that I would get in my pencil drawings of freedom and exercised it. And, it and suddenly, I, at the age of 80, I was drawing a style that I'd wanted to all my life, or close to it, and it was working, for God's sake. And so I illustrated the book, and, uh, which is dedicated to, there's, there I am, a private eye. It was the Milton Kniff, Will Eisner, Hammett, Chandler, and Ch Kane, and John Houston, Billy Wilder, Howard Hawks, and as an afterthought, Joan Z. Holden, who I married two years later. Uh, <laughs> because I couldn't marry the other guys, they were all dead. <laughs> And, 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 and the wrong calling. Um, and just as Eisner created atmosphere on the page, I went after atmosphere, rain-swept streets. I didn't know how to draw a rain-swept street. I had to fiddle with it and fiddle with it. And, and how to apply the, the uh, 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 ink and water and get things mixed up and slosh around. And it was great fun making a mess. I felt like a kid in a sandbox. And, uh, or cars. On, on the road, on the highway. You know, again, atmosphere, atmosphere, atmosphere. And it was, I just had a ball. And this is my hero, Elsie, who starts out in 1933, uh, uh, the year of gold diggers of 1933. And, and, um, uh, and that's a, th that began to establish the style I was evolving toward. And there she is out in the street. And you know, it, it, it all had a realism that, um, that was all new to me and great fun. And every page was both terrifying because I felt that I'm not qualified to do this, which I was not, and, uh, and, and, and created the goal to make it work somehow. And it worked. I didn't have to do any pages over. I just thought about them, fiddled with them, played with them, and it was a form of endless play. And, um, and I thought, Kill My Mother would be a one-shot, but it raised so many questions and left so many things untied that I had to do a second book. And then I realized the third, that would tie it up all, so it'd be kind of a trilogy unintentionally. And it's about, in Kill My Mother, there's a cop named Sam Hannigan who's never seen. He was killed at the beginning of the book, and he's the father and husband of the lead woman characters in the book. And his death is like Banquo's ghost. It haunts the book. And how was he killed? He, he, he was shot and thrown in the river, we don't know by who. And so I had to tell that story. And first I wrote the text, and I was almost up to the last page before I knew who killed him. <laughs> I, I didn't have a clue. Then, then suddenly as I was writing it, I knew. And that's the fun of it, that, 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 that surprising myself, which is what the art does. What, 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 every line I draw surprises me because I don't know where it's going. I just let it have freedom. And that's Sam Hannigan. Uh, that's the prologue page. This is the way I started drawing out of nowhere. And this is Cousin Joseph, who was only seen once in the entire book. And the rest of the time, he's a disembodied voice lecture, uh, and, a, and a voice of um, American uh, super patriotism. And this is Sam <coughs> headed out in the case. <coughs> this is Sam doing what he does best. <coughs> beating the crap out of people who get in his way. <laughs> and that's, you know, th that replaced dance for me. That replaced... <laughs> Signally, see how those feet move? <laughs> uh, and, th you know, and, 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 and because I couldn't dance anymore, I, I used fighters in dance because comics have to have fights and two men having it out with each other. These guys happen to be friends and they go in for this brawl regularly, and it's, and it's just great fun to do what I loved in comics as a kid, guys beating up each other, but, make, <laughs> but, but, but making it emote. You know, each, each pose denotes the character of the man throwing the punch and getting hit by the punch, uh, and they, they move differently, and, they, and, and it, it, so it's, I feel like the screenwriter, at the same time the director, and I'm all the actors, and, you know, and I do all the casting. Uh, and, I, and I fire people, you know, <laughs> sometimes myself. And this is Sam on the line, talking to Cousin Joseph, who gives the theme of the book, which is what I want to read to you right now. Uh, from, it's the text of these two pages. This page, 
and this page. Uh, excuse me. Sam has been sent to Hollywood to beat up a producer named Cornblum, who's given money to make movies with no messages, just the beast, the entertainment. And he's now making a message movie, and he has to be made a lesson of. Uh, and Cousin Joseph says, Cornblum's hubris puts at risk all our good work, Sam. Why should Europe buy films about an America that is down and out, or worse, shows racial and religious intolerance? Europe and the rest of the world don't want to import our problems. They have plenty of their own. They want our love stories, our comedies. It's these immigrants, their fault. First, nobody wanted them in their own countries, so we let them in here. This crowd, who no one could stand in the first place, their looks, their religion, their manners, what were we going to do with them? Aggressive, pushy. We looked for some place out of the way. How mistake we gave them Hollywood. Nobody wanted it. No water. A desert far away from anyone who or anything that counted. But, cl but, but clever, this tribe, full of surprises. For over a thousand years, they became practiced at being unwanted and making the best of it. So what do they do out there in exile? They invent the film business, which before them no one was interested. And what did they choose to make films about? Their problems? No. If our America didn't accept them, they would invent another dream America, their own version, romantic, optimistic, glamorous. And when the America that, that, that couldn't stand them saw the America they were making films about, they decided that's the America they wanted too. And soon the whole wide world wanted to share the America invented by these people no one could stand. <laughs> so what happens, Sam? As the night falls, the day would always happen when things are going well. Some of these immigrants, all their children, living the high life in Beverly Hills, they, they decide they don't like being entertainers. They want to be artists, tackle serious subjects that rub our noses and our sins and our hypocrisies, the fools. The more these works of art are shown overseas, the more everybody stays away. This is not the America they go to the movies for. The market dries up, and so, Sam, we come to your mission with the music boxes, which, which, which have money in it to pay these guys off. What you do, Sam, is like a patriot on the front, uh, 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 on the front lines, convincing these phonies to be entertainers again. And it's working, Sam, but always there is a danger of slipping back. There is no time to, let, to delay your mission. Cornblum must be made an example of. And that really becomes the story of the book. Uh, and let's see. Now, I don't know how that got in there. Um, as I say, I was dependent on movies. This guy was dependent on movies. We're dependent on the same movies. There's Bogart, there's Cagney, there's Ed Robinson, there's George Raft, Eduardo Cianelli, great. <laughs> All these, Barton McLean, John Garfield on the right. Ed was, you know, Ed, I don't know if you met Ed. Uh, <laughs> Ed was haunted by the same thing I was haunted by. But Ed wasn't the only one. There were three of us who identified with these other cartoonists uh, through the early and later years of our career. Here he is, David Levine, uh, a great, great caricaturist for the New York Review of Books. And I thought that he should be saluted as well in this talk. And uh, as a final salute, one of David's great characters will say good night to you. <laughs> good night. That last drawing of Donald Trump, was that a diaper on him? It was? Yes. It's, uh, yeah. what else could it be? <laughs> But it was an American diaper. And, and, a, <laughs> and, I, and, and, and believe me, a law and order diaper. Did either of you have any formal training in your artwork? Did you go to art school or did you just wing it? Um, my formal training, I went to, uh, Ed and I had similar disappointments in formal training. Um, he went to Cooper Union, learned Nothing. Uh, 
I, learned, I went to Pratt Institute in 1947 and discovered that the one form they had more contempt for than any other was cartooning. <laughs> and uh, because it wasn't really creative and it wasn't an art. Advertising was an art. <laughs> and that's what they respect. So I learned nothing. Uh, it's, um, but before that, I went to the Art Students League and studied anatomy with a man who later became um, head of the, uh, the curator of American arts at the um, uh, um, Metropolitan Museum, uh, Robert Beverly Hale, who was a tall Brahmin and spoke, he spoke in a way that made George Plimpton sound like an immigrant. And, 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 <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Hale would take a long piece of chalk on a stick, a little charcoal, and go over your anatomy drawings and tear them apart the way you did to this young lady and correct them and tell you. But he did it in such a supportive way. He did it, he was about the work. Not for a moment did you think, well, I'm a lousy artist or I should be dead or I'm no good at all, all of which were true, but, he, but, 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 but what he was engaging in, he was working out of such a high level in craft that you felt yourself elevated by him into being colleagues. And, and, and so after he destroyed drawing after drawing of mine, instead of wanting to kill myself, I just wanted to do more and more and more. And years later, when I began teaching, I learned from him that it doesn't matter how you trash them or how you beat them up, they have to know you're on their side. And if they know you're on their side, you can say anything to them. So I made clear through my own way, of which was being funny and, and, and kidding around, but also very, very strong in terms of what I had to say, that uh, I could beat the crap out of them, but that's, you know, but they were gonna learn from it, and they did, and, I, and that's, that's how I, Learn to be a good teacher and love the act of teaching and, my, and, and, and students. So, so that the most valuable um, art teacher I had was Mr. Hale. I, uh, my experience is similar to, to Jules, except that I never had, a, I never encountered a good art teacher in my entire life. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> well, in your case, you didn't need to. Well, it's true. I, I was a very talented kid. I, I was very lucky. I got double pneumonia and pleurisy before they invented penicillin. So I had a year and a half in which to draw pictures in bed. Uh, <clears throat> and I was pretty good in, in public school, but uh, then I was accepted at music and art. And the first thing they told me was to draw a face, draw a line down the middle, and then make everything, make every plane a different color. And, um, and that was not what I wanted to learn. I did not want to learn abstraction. I did not want to learn cubism. I wanted to learn how to draw. And they wouldn't teach me how to draw. I somehow or other made Cooper Union on the second try, the first time I failed the intelligence test. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which was all about G uh, algebra, and the second time, the second time I took the test, I passed the algebra and passed the art. But uh, at Cooper Union, they just taught you flat design. It was all about cubism. I mean, aside from being 25 years behind the times, uh, uh, what I wanted to do was do pictures that that. Uh, told a story. I, I wanted to do pictures like John Sloan or Reginald Marsh, but by 1950, when I was in art school, those people were laughed at. They were a joke. At the, the artists that were being paid attention to in 1950 were Franz Klein, who drew a black slash across a seven-foot canvas, and Robert Motherwell and Bazzi Hodes, and a vast variety of no talent assholes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, so, and. Uh, but rich. What? Rich. But rich, yes. The, the, the crazy thing is, you know, late, later in life, 
I, I, I somehow got into the homes of rich people. I got into the homes of people like Cy Newhouse and, and other people. Well, you, you too. You, you saw the kind of art they collect. They collect Andy Warhol. These are people who could have bought Rembrandt's, and they're buying Andy Warhol. I mean, <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, uh, and more yeah. important, they could have been buying Sorrel. Well, <laughs> cheap. <laughs> uh, but anyway, in answer to your question, what I learned in school was nothing. I literally, what saved my life was I went to school at Cooper Union. I was in class with two extremely talented students, Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast, and uh, we started a studio together. I could not draw anymore. I literally, I, you think that I'm exaggerating. I could not draw. All I could do was cut paper and make things flat and design. Uh, and thanks to Milton and thanks to Seymour, who encouraged me to go back to drawing, I finally got back to it. But, uh, and I started a studio called Pushpin. Pushpin. And, and, Which but, was uh, extremely influential at this time. And as the years went by, when, when I first graduated, Cooper, I was so grateful for my free education, so I gave them a lot of money of the little salary I made. But as the years went by, I got angrier and angrier, <laughs> and I give them nothing. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I don't ever remember you being angry. I just <laughs> Well, Jules knows that I, that I well, wake see, up angry. I, but, I, uh, I had a head start over Ed because I couldn't get into those colleges. They turned me down. Cooper Union and NYU School of the Arts. So I had to start working immediately. And fortunately, never went to college, and so I didn't have to unlearn all of that horseshit. You're, you had a privileged childhood. I don't think that was a diaper. I think that was a chastity belt. <laughs> Should have been a chastity belt. Anyway, uh, my question is really in follow-up to what you've been talking about. What would you advise a young person now in terms of who wants to be a cartoonist in terms of his or her education? Julie, you want to take this? How would we advise a young person now? How would you advise a young person? Uh, the best advice I could give is I am 88, I have no position to advise anybody. Uh, uh, but uh, Ed being three months younger, perhaps. <laughs> um, but you, you know, there is... What there Jules is, so is trying to say is what? that the field has disappeared. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, there are no more assignments. Uh, the print has print is print is gone. The computer has taken over not only our lives, but it's taken over it's taken over print. And uh, there are fewer there there were so many magazines when I started out. And, uh, no, and now they're gone. Uh, your, the Village Voice is gone. The uh, essentially gone uh, magazines are gone. Uh, how what all you could. All you could say uh, is to, to your friend is uh, go into, take a degree in business administration. No, I, uh, uh, see, when, when, when I started writing plays when playwriting was dead. And suddenly there was, while I was trying to figure out how to write plays, there was All Be Out of Nowhere and Samuel Beckett and John Genet and Jack Gilbert and Arthur Copet and suddenly a whole new theater was, you know, um, that when these fields are dead, they're ripe for takeover. And, they've, and, and, and art has always died and come back because people need these forms. And the, the newspaper comic strip is gone, the editorial cartoon is gone, but what we have is an alternative comics business now, which is the highest form of comic art I have seen since probably the beginning and some of the most, I mean, some lousy work is done, as Ed keeps pointing out to me, but... Uh, <laughs> But we have Chris Ware, and we have Linda Barry, and we have uh, you know, an, a, an extraordinary assortment of truly astonishing people who have taught me 
uh, that I wanted to be in this craft. I mean, I, nothing I innovated uh, came on its own. I just followed them into this field that, that, um, that uh, my friend, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, did Stitches. And I saw that the, the extraordinary work you could do that was personal and evocative and, 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 um, and looked like a movie on paper. And I thought movies on paper is a damn good way to spend the rest of my life. And that's when I'm, so you, you stumble on these things and anybody who's interested, you just have to, you can't go into it in terms of thinking you're gonna make a living. Um, you have to have some other way of making your money. But if you go into it thinking it's a form of play, it's something to fool with, it's your sandbox and you're gonna get in and make a mess and see what comes of it, uh, it's amazing what does come up of it, and eventually you may do very well. But if you go into it and thinking of making a buck, forget about it. It's the, the, there is too much work, and it takes too much time. Uh, so even when you do sell the work, you don't get well paid for it. Uh, um, so of course, you can marry someone who has a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> we we all, we can't all be you. I hate to do this. We are at the end of our time. We are a union shop, so we have to close the door on this conversation. Please join me in thanking Ed Sorrell and Jews. Bye, please.